Thanks, man. So before I start, I really have to tell you this is strange. Usually I'm down there, not up here. So uh, please forgive. It's been a little while since I've done this. Could I have my slides, please? Oh, there they are. So we did go down to be citizen journalists. We went down because BP has one highly scripted story. They, you go to their website, you see the people up on, on the beach looking at you, find numbers, including a phone number for investor relations if you happen to care about your dividend. The White House has their story. You know, $20 billion. The New York Times and other major media outlets, they've been down there, they've covered it, but they've already moved on to other things. I mean, you've got ZZ Top playing on stage here somewhere, not the oil spill. And even Anderson Cooper is going to move on. So we pulled together our team, Pinar Osgar, photographer, writer Darren Collins, photographer Chris Krug, and myself, and we made plans to head off to this, the Gulf of Mexico. This is our report. Now, it's hard to figure out where to start telling this story. So I'm going to start on a beach in Grand Isle. This is a ball of tar that's in my hand while standing on the beach. It had only been out of the water for an hour or two, and it had traveled over 100 miles to be here. This is what the beach looks like. It's covered in tar, and probably a few hours before this, when the security crew were out there, I mean, not the security crew, a few hours before this, when the cleaning crews had been out there, it was probably pristine. We had seen this time and time again in our expedition. Clean beaches would immediately become oiled once everybody went home. This is the same beach during the day when the workers and security team were out there. Now during the day, this orange barrier, that's the do not cross line. You go across that and the folks from Talon who are kind of like Blackwater will come and uh, escort you off for a little bit of a detainment as uh, Darren will speak about later. The other thing about having this, this blockade line 100 feet away from the beach is that it's really hard to see what's happening down at the water line. This is an effective means of control of the images coming from there. This is Barataria Bay. Grand Island is up at the top, and the Gulf of Mexico is beyond. And in the foreground is, the, the, is Barataria Bay. You can see oil in the water. You see the heavier oil kind of in the mid-ground. But one thing I want to point out is you see this diagonal line in the lower left-hand corner? That's where a ship is cut through sheen. Now, Looking at the color of that, you might not think there's oil in the water until you see that telltale. But that's a very important telltale, as you'll see in more photos to come. This is Fort Livingston. This is just to the north of Grand Isle. You can see oil in the water here as well, as well as oil on the break. Moving inland, we get into the marsh wetlands. We found boom everywhere and we also found oil on the wrong side of the boom. The white boom down the middle is absorbent boom, and you can see oil pocketed between it and the marshland. We also found lots of boom laying tangled uselessly in the middle of the bay, doing absolutely nothing. Now, the important thing to note when you're looking at these photos is, you know, the boom's out there, it's trying to do its job, but the, gra the oil is already in the grass and the brown grass that you see here is already dead. Now, the marsh wetlands in this part of Louisiana, the grass is what holds them together. They've been eroding for years. This area has had, has had um, disaster after disaster hit it, eroding the wetlands away. This is just the latest insult. From ground level, it can be harder to see the oil, but anywhere you look and you see the booms in the water, you see the evidence thereof. Now, these booms reportedly are, are either cleaned or replaced every week or so. So when we were down there, it had been several weeks since the last heavy oiling, but the booms were still picking up lots of oil. This is the new normal right now for life in Barataria Bay. Everywhere you look in the bay, you can find evidence of oil. Every ship bears brown stains all over it. 
this is a shrimping boat, or it was a shrimping boat until recently. Now it's been placed in the service to clean up the oil spill. All the, shipping, all the fishing boats that we saw looked pretty much like this. Now the fishermen that are working on these boats, well, now they're oil spill cleanup workers, they are, they're getting well paid for their work, but they still have several concerns. This is a rally of Vietnamese fishermen in uh, Biloxi. They had come to this country a few decades ago to work, and now they're out of their original work. Now they're now being pressed into service as oil spill workers, and they're rallying to get access to information about the oil in their own language, and to get debt relief, and to have health care. There's also a lot of local protest signs that are coming up here and there. This one is in a bait and tackle shop. This one's on the side of the road. It's a rally organized by a church. And this is outside a tattoo parlor in the middle of Louisiana. Now, getting into the air over the Gulf of Mexico proved to be a challenge. There's actually a huge controlled airspace set up that's being monitored by a Navy P-3 Orion. To go into this space requires special approval, and you have to get approval from a board that also has BP on it. Until recently, they weren't letting anybody out there except their own folks, even government officials. They had to fly on BP helicopters or BP air flights. We did finally, however, find one group of people that would fly us out there. This is Dickey. He was our pilot for uh, our two missions out over the Gulf, and uh, they were able to get us clearance and not take crap from anybody in doing so. This is what the oil looks like from above. This is 2,000 feet up in the air, and it's a little hard to get a sense of the scale of it. Boats help. Here's a skimmer. There's another boat from further away, and even further away. Now, they're trying to take care of the oil by burning it, but there are several concerns with this, not the least of which is all the sargassum that is in the Gulf of Mexico. The sargassum holds a load of wildlife in it, and as they collect up the oil, they're collecting up the sargassum and everything in it and burning it as well. This is the site. This is the source of the oil spill. It's a hub of busy activity, but what the photos can't tell you is what it smelled like. So let me describe it for you. Walk into a garage, take a case of motor oil, dump it out onto the ground. Take a bunch of gasoline, pour it on top of it. Now take a can of propane, crack it open, let the propane vent out into the air, maybe crack another one to turn it, uh, and light it on fire. Now take some Windex, throw it into the mix. That's what it smells like when you're orbiting the site. These flares are flaring off all the gas that are coming up that they can't produce. You can see these flares from 20 miles away as you approach the site. They're that bright. Now, on one of our flights from the source, we flew north to Gulf Shores, Alabama. It's 100, 120 miles away. And as we flew, we saw nothing but oil all the way. Even in places where it wasn't obvious it was oil, you can still find those telltale tracks that boats have left. This is uh, Gulf Shores. You can see the oil coming in it, and you can also see a few boats out there trying to skim away the oil and do something effective with it. It's really kind of hard to see how effective they can be, but they're out there doing it anyway. From the ground, again, it's hard to see the oil in the water, but sometimes you'll see it in the waves. Sometimes it comes in heavy, sometimes it's light, but it's always out there. It's on the beaches. This is a beach that was cleaned an hour before we were there, and it's washing up again. The workers are out there cleaning in Alabama. Now, in, in Mississippi, they highly regulate the access to the beaches. In Alabama, they are um, quite a lot less restrictive. They are guarding out the places where the workers are actually holding all their equipment, but they let people out onto the beaches, even though the oil is there. We think this is because Alabama is trying to promote a business-as-usual 
um, attitude. So we got out onto this beach without a problem. And it's amazing the effort of cleanup going on in this. But one has to wonder why this beach, which has economic value, is getting so much attention and the marshlands are not. And even though they're cleaning up the beaches, the oil is still in the water. There's signs posted, but we are flabbergasted to find this scene. There was a family, father, mother, watching two kids fishing something out of this water. They were netting for a good five or 10 minutes and they walked away with full nets. So if you plot out our trip on a map, these are all the locations we went to, Grand Isle, New Orleans, Gulf Shores, and out to the source. In our trip, a week long, we were only able to touch a small fraction of the scope of this thing, even though we traveled hundreds of miles and flew hundreds of miles. The scope of this thing is huge. It's going to affect everything in the Gulf. And as Philippe said earlier, you really have to consider that the ocean isn't just the surface. There's all the wildlife in the water itself. It's a three-dimensional problem, and the scale is huge. So along the way, we actually um, collected several small stories, and uh, more stories than we can tell right now, but Darren has three stories that he's going to give to you now. <laughs> 